Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kevin Moran, executive editor of the Berkshire Eagle, and I want to thank you for joining us here at uh, theberkshireeagle.com and on our Facebook page and hopefully on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, today, we'll be talking about the, the immediate future of Pittsfield Public Schools. We have two very special guests, Superintendent Jake McCandless and Melissa Campbell, who's the president of the United Educators of Pittsfield. Um, it's been uh, a, obviously a, a really disrupted uh, school year ever since the coronavirus started in mid-March and, and, and classes were curtailed. Obviously, municipal budgets have been impacted. School budgets probably will be impacted to some degree. And those are really some of the issues that are making headlines right now here, at least in the Berkshire Eagle and throughout the Berkshires. And so with that, I am very, very, very honored to have uh, three, or actually two wonderful guests. Uh, Jake McCandless. Hello, Jake. How are you? I'm good, Kevin. Thank you. And Melissa Campbell, president of the uh, United Educators of Pittsfield. Thanks, Melissa. How are you? Thanks for inviting me. I am well, thank you. Great. Well, you know, uh, literally, I, I maybe uh, Jake, uh, Superintendent McCandless, if if uh, if I may call you Jake, if that's all right with you. <laughs> all right. Um, can you bring us up to speed on sort of the latest developments this week with regard to the fact that the Pittsfield Public Schools are anticipating a, a budget shortfall because of decreases in uh, in some federal funding, if I'm not mistaken, specifically, and uh, and certainly some some gaps there. Um, and it's my understanding that um, that you and Melissa and, and Mayor Linda Tyre and others uh, recently fired off a letter to some lawmakers. Can you uh, bring us up to speed on that? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, and it is a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to share a screen or a space with Ms. Campbell, uh, who taught two of my three children. Uh, the ones that are good at math. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so happy to be here. Yeah, we, uh, you know, this year's budget, obviously, just like like uh, every other organization and uh, every other home and, and individual, our budget was impacted uh, by COVID-19 and the uh, the coma that the economy was was put into as a result of COVID-19. If we go back three and a half months. Uh, you know, Ms. Campbell and I are, are talking about how, what are we going to do with the with the additional $3 million that we're going to get uh, via the Student Opportunities Act. And then COVID-19 hits. And, uh, you know, according to the Massachusetts Taxpayer Foundation, the uh, the tax shortfall for the, Mass for the Commonwealth is going to be about $6 billion as a result of this. The Commonwealth's rainy day fund is about uh, $3.5 million, as I think the Eagle said in its editorial a day or two ago. Uh, and so obviously we, we went from having one budget scenario to bringing forward a very different budget scenario. And in this case, we felt like it was a very optimistic scenario given the economy. It was a level funded budget. Now, because our expenses go up every year, uh, a level funded budget does mean that we actually needed to make reductions of stuff and uh, much more painfully of staff. Uh, and the, the, so there's the budget that we presented, which was a level funded budget that the city council has had a time or two and is sent back to the school committee and we'll be re revisiting that on Monday afternoon. Uh, but you know, the, the, the real concern, I mean, we don't like to lose any staff. Uh, it's, it's people that make things happen for kids in education. Our real concern, however, are the next level of reductions that we had to be prepared for if the state reduces our Chapter 70, which is the legal mechanism through which the, the state funds local schools. If Chapter 70 is reduced by even 5%, uh, we're, we're looking at another uh, couple million dollars in potential cuts. And so that's really our concern. So we've been lobbying our state officials hard uh, to, to keep Chapter 70 funding at least level. Uh, and we've been uh, lobbying our federal officials 
because we believe the federal government needs to provide more money to the state so that public schools can do uh, what I think uh, Missy and I would agree is going to be even more challenging work when we get back to school in the fall after this lengthy shutdown. So, uh, Melissa, you know, it's not unusual necessarily for the any school system to issue notices in advance in anticipation of, you know, an impact on teachers. But I, I think one of the remarkable things was the fact that, you know, this year the number of, of, you know, warning notices here was 140, and that was certainly a larger number. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, so when you see sort of a larger number of, uh, of that type of thing, you know, sort of preparing, um, preparing that, uh, you know, so sort of what is the, what is the worry uh, that goes through your mind uh, as not only, you know, the head of the United Educators of, of Pittsfield, but, you know, mainly as, as, a, as, a, as a teacher yourself at Herbert Middle School? Right. Um, so I've been, a, I've been in the Pittsfield Public Schools for 10 years, and I have not been through this magnitude of a layoff. Um, 100 and, this is like 140, and we have in the UEP around 530, 550. So if you think about that, the math person in me is going to say, that's a fifth of our workforce that is working directly with students. The impact is great. And then you add the potential COVID requirements that the um, state is coming up with, which are saying smaller class sizes, um, you know, all the a class of 10, I have at least 20 in every class. So now... open and follow these guidelines so guys even if we didn't have covid every one of those people is it has an impact on students so you know the magnitude of this is great and certainly we have attrition each year we have in some of those positions may not be refilled but this is a huge magnitude it's, it's a fit that's a lot so uh jake what is uh what is the process uh for you know, getting ready to to send out those notices, and I, I can't, for the life of me, imagine um, you know, uh, write you know, writing up those things and, and sending those out. I mean, that's um, you know, as a as a person who loves education, whose you know, whose job and sole responsibility it is. Um, and in in a letter to the public, you 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 laid out how difficult it was. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, happy to, uh, not happy to, but I will certainly talk about that. It's, uh, it's awful. You know, it's, it's something that you know when you go into administration, particularly when you uh, enter into the superintendent world. You, you do know that part of your job is um, you're running a business. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's, a, it's as people-centered of a business as has ever existed but there are aspects of it that are like running a business. And, uh, you know, and we cannot, as, as all business people know, you cannot make promises to employees that you know that you may not be able to keep. And so without knowing what 70% of our funding stream, that's how much Chapter 70 means to the city of Pittsfield public schools budgets. Last year it was 73.9%. Uh, of our of our entire budget, not knowing what that number is, uh, meant that we had to move into this mode as uh, moral, ethical uh, business people, and and start looking at okay, how do we do this? And we were we didn't want to make value judgments about well, there there are schools in the Commonwealth that said okay, we're going to wipe out all of the arts, you know, arts aren't required. We're going to wipe out the arts or sports aren't required we're going to wipe out sports neither one of those uh would have done the trick money wise for us it's important for people to understand so we we took a pathway of sending notices to every one of our first year teachers um through through a, a legal mechanism known as non-professional teacher status uh non-renewal 
we opted to just say, you know, every single building, every department, every program has at least one first year teacher. And so that, uh, that horrendous, horrific nuclear scenario, should we have to enact it? Uh, it, it, it was a painful enough exercise just to go through and look at those names and think of those faces that our principals worked about hiring uh, last summer. You know, we, we want these people to come to Pittsburgh. We're taxing for uh, Ms. Campbell and, and the UEP officials. And, and first of all, super taxing on the individuals that are now sitting uh, starting tomorrow, the first day after school officially ends, not knowing if the, the job that they love and have prepared for is going to be there for them. Melissa, you, 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 the teachers, uh, you know, have been very vocal about this, too. And, uh, you know, there was a large standout, you know, recently in, in Park Square in Pittsfield as well. Um, you know, so you're making your voices known, and I know that the school department is, you know, encouraging parents to speak up and call their, write their email, text, uh, tweet at, uh, you know, the, our, our, our lawmakers. Uh, but what other advice can you possibly, you know, can you suggest uh, or maybe reinforce the existing advice to make sure that, um, you know, that uh, citizens, you know, parents, uh, our voices are heard. Yeah. Um, so our, again, our our fight is with the state funding and the federal government because we, we can't. None of us can do our jobs if there's no money, right? So that's certainly where you should be writing your state your um, state senators. Um, Trisha Farley BGA uh, is a representative. She there our local representatives are so supportive. Adam Hines is at our standout. Trisha. Um, is always advocating for a, a mark. Um, and then, you know, Liz Warren, certainly, like, Massachusetts senators know what we need. Our issue is how do we get the other states? So I'm not quite sure. So if you, if you have family members in other states, maybe your family members can write to their, you know, senators. Um, I find this whole thing very interesting because the federal government doesn't bat an eye at bailing out businesses. As soon as we knew we were shutting, Businesses were like, oh, you can get a loan, you can do this, you can do this. Their, their second thought is, oh, we're going to cut public education. How are we supposed to educate our future job holders if you're not funding your public education? If they, they, don't, they don't go together. Um, Jake, what do you see? Do you, what's your confidence level right now that we're going to get some of this back? Um, are you optimistic, not confident? Yeah, I, yes, I am. Uh, Con I, I'm optimistic not, or conf uh, optimistic I, or not? <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I, I am optimistic. Uh, I, I tend to avoid confident uh, of almost any sort uh, because it doesn't very feel like a safe place to be. But I, I, I am optimistic and I'm very confident that uh, Representative Farley Bouvier, Representative Mark, Senator Hines, uh, Senator Markey, Senator Warren, uh, Congressman Neal, they, they are all uh, well-renowned for rolling up their sleeves, putting on their, their work shoes, and, and pushing hard uh, for what the, their Commonwealth and uh, their localities need. So I am very confident in them, and I, and I am I am likewise confident in uh, in the Baker Polito administration uh, that that they they too want to see Chapter 70 at a minimum be kept whole. Uh, I know that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is pushing hard. I think their sort of operative uh, philosophy is uh, at least level funding, but ideally level funding plus, because as as Ms. Campbell alluded to. If we have 10 students in a classroom so we can run school in person next year, um, you know, we just executed an order for $100,000 worth of masks for mm -hmm. students and staff. Um, joining tens of thousands of dollars that we've spent on signage, plexiglass, hand sanitizer, 
et cetera. School is going to be different in the fall than it's ever been before. So, uh, you know, we, we have to stay confident. Uh, I'm ending my 15th year as a superintendent. This is the first time I've ever seen a budget pushed back by a, by a select board or a city council because they didn't think it had enough money and that it made too deep of cuts. So, you know, uh, our, our city officials are concerned about this. Our school committee is not sleeping at nights over this. Uh, our administration and our union, as we often are, are hand in hand and on the exact same page with this. And we have tremendous faith in our, in our uh, elected officials to push the Commonwealth and the federal government to do the right thing for children in uh, the Commonwealth and across the country. Melissa, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Like we are, we are as Pittsfield, we're all in this together. We're all working whatever angles we have. I am working with the Mass Teachers Association. Their number one priority is full funding for public schools. We worked very hard to get the Student Opportunities Act to pass, and that money that was coming to Pittsfield was to make us whole. We're already behind, right? So now you're saying, oh no, we're not gonna catch you up, and now we're gonna cut even more. So, you know, we're working hard as a state union. Um, Mary and Jimmy is a Pittsfield native. She, you know, she has done a great job of organizing all our local unions across the state, because quite often, um, I would joke that Western Mass is Worcester, and if you're lucky, it's Springfield. Barely does Berkshire County make the cut. So it's really nice to have leadership that has roots in Berkshire County because she always makes sure that our voices are heard. And um, I'm on a statewide committee with her on, you know, how are we going to reopen? And we, we are pushing um, from every angle we have for funding that we were promised, which would include that $3 million extra dollars this year. I say extra, but our gap is huge. So it's really a $20 million they're trying to over the course of seven years filling. Indeed. Um, let's, uh, if, if you don't mind, let's in fact talk about some of the various scenarios or, or what it's shaping up to look like when it comes to the return of classes in the fall. Um, uh, uh, Jake, I know that uh, you know the school sent out a survey of parents and asked a lot of questions. Um, I, have, any, have you started to compile any of those results yet? And because there was what several options right there were there were you know various options in terms of you know do a do a half day in school a half day the rest of the day a remote learning uh a couple of you know some students come to school on these days of the week the others come on the other days um have you gotten any any feedback have you seen those results yet and, and can maybe uh, I, you talk about I, that I, I, I'm certain that our deputy superintendent, Mr. Curtis, probably has an alert on his phone that tells him every time one has come back. I have not looked at the at the survey results yet. I like to look at when it's in and the poll is closed and, and, and I can see the whole picture. Uh, you know, we, we really do want to get a handle on, look, we, we know that, that one of our core missions as a public school system is to provide child care. Uh, and I'm not embarrassed or ashamed to say that. That is, a, that is a crucial function in the life of a community. Uh, without child care, there are parts of our economy that simply cannot operate. So we are very, very interested in, in reopening uh, this fall. If we had magic wands, we would reopen just the way we reopened in September of, of 2019, uh, where everybody came in person. But we're trying to get a handle on, on uh, how many families, if we're open in some scenario, how many families are still going to opt to keep their children home until there's a cure or a vaccine. And we anticipate that that's likely to be upwards of 20% of our families, just from conversations we've all been having. Um, we're very curious about, okay, we're not going to have the best case scenario where your child comes to school all day, every day, five days a week. What, what type of scenario lends itself best to your being able to have a work life, personal life, and, and to have your child have a powerful academic life? 
we anticipate in the end that the Commonwealth is going to come out with uh, something between guidance and a directive. It may not be a directive. I think there will be wiggle room uh, for communities to, to respond to their unique circumstances. I mean, the Pittsfield Public Schools, we have uh, over 103 and four year olds that we serve in our pre-Ks. We have uh, close to 100 uh, people that we serve in our adult ed program uh, on North Street, the William Stickney Adult Ed Program. We have about 500 students next year, uh, 480 or so that are vocational students who do week on week off. Some of them go to work for part of their school day, some of them. We have a lot of nuances that we have to be ready to adjust to next year. So we do, we, we are really interested in our families' responses. We will be sharing that survey data with the state. We know that the Mass Teachers Association is working uh, equally as hard looking at how can we make this work for the families we serve, the children we serve, and how can we make it work for the people that actually do the serving, uh, our teachers and our staff. So we will, the governor, I think, is likely to come out with some guidance next week on what this is going to look like. And, and we, along with the rest of the world, are, uh, are, are waiting eagerly. And we've been working, just so you know, we've been working on three different scenarios from, from early April. That we open up with lots of PPE, that we, uh, that we may have to be fully remote again, depending on... Uh, the situation on the ground and we want to be better prepared to attack that should it happen and then the third scenario which i think is the most likely that we have kids in person for part of the time and learning remotely for part of the time so we never have our buildings filled to capacity uh, melissa in, in terms of um you know uh, the impact of uh, of this uh, you know from a teacher's perspective too what what does the fall look like for you and and what you know maybe you can get into a little bit about what some of the challenges have been uh, this past spring uh, you know connecting with students um, you know in full disclosure I have a couple kids at Allendale uh, as well and uh, you know it's it's not easy for the kids or, or you know the parent or parents who are at home and uh, you know certainly uh, teachers uh, have their kids too they're also teachers who have their students uh, you know, so it's really, you know, the spring was a quite an interesting and in, 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 in some ways, for some folks, perhaps challenging, or that maybe that's too light of a word. Um, but from a teacher's perspective, um, you know, what, how do you see f the fall coming together? Would you, what would you advocate for? Um, so... We may be there. You, there you go. I'm sorry. We we lost your audio there for a second because of the connection. Yeah, but so, go ahead. Um, you know, through the MTA, we're working on some guidelines for for reopening, so that we're kind of all having a consistent and that more staff because we're going to need it. But you know, number one is our schools need to be safe. Like people need to be safe. The teachers need to feel safe going to school. Students need to feel safe. Families need to, um, if you have loved ones at home, like what can you be bringing them back to them? So safety is our number one concern. Um, but we also seem to be pushing hard to um, we're pretty behind. We know that. So why don't we take that precious time that we spend trying to get them ready for that test and actually educate them and try to fill in those gaps? Um, when I think about the fall and teaching, um, my head just just spins. So I get a certain place and then I'm like, I can't think about this anymore. So the challenge is, so I teach eighth grade and math. So the challenge right there is I've got middle school kids who, you know, they're typically in a, a unique set of challenges in that you know, they don't, they're not small enough where a parent might say, okay, they're gonna kind of micromanage them, but they're also not, they don't have the organizational skills as many high school kids do to, to you know, set up their schedule. So I would say the biggest challenge I had was reaching students and having them engage with me. Once I got them on a regular schedule with me, they were pretty successful. 
um, they would join into whatever you know online meeting I had, and um, I had a pretty good structure going. So I, I mean, certainly it was a learning experience for me, um, and I think all of us have learned over this time. Like, what are some things that work with kids? What are some things that don't? Um, but the number one challenge is getting those students in front of you, getting them to my Google Meets. I had parents say, I, "My student is struggling. They just can't." You know, they can't watch the video that you sent and, and do the assignment. And I said, well, please have them come to my meeting. And there's a question and answers, and we can work through that. And that, that was better. I certainly not perfect. Um, but I feel like some of us are getting the hang of it much better. But it's, it's exhausting trying to track things down and, you know, marry your grade book with your online system and, and keeping everything in, in order. It's a mentally exhausting way to teach. I noticed, though, you know, from the beginning of of uh, of the learn from home uh, toward the end, everybody got better at it, though. Yeah. And so that was kind of kind of neat. You know, one of the things I, I know, uh, Jake, that, you know, Pittsfield did is made sure that students had access to Chromebooks. Um, and then certainly they may have access to Chromebooks. But uh, one of the challenges I can only imagine that some of the challenges for families here in Pittsfield is they might not have internet access, which is a is a real concern. Uh, and so there's been you know Chromebooks and that's and you know and I um, you know and I and I worry about or have you know worried about whether you know those kids are able to even to connect with with the teachers uh, from remote learning. Yeah, we, we we worry about the same thing, and I know I speak for for Ms. Campbell and and all of our teachers and for our entire staff, uh, all of whom care about kids, even as they care for kids. Uh, you know, we, we distributed uh, over 2,900 Chromebooks. That was in addition to about 400 that we already had out to our advanced placement students. Uh, when we get back in September, we will distribute uh, Chromebooks to the rest of our families, the rest of our individual students that did not receive a Chromebook from the school in case we need to move into a fully remote uh, mode of teaching and learning again. Uh, we are meeting once again with a, with a powerful group on uh, Monday or Tuesday uh, to look at the, the internet divide. Uh, because you're right, a Chromebook, uh, for anybody you know listening or watching that's not familiar with the Chromebook, it's a, it's a Google product, it's a laptop computer but unlike uh, some laptop computers, it, everything is based uh, on being on the internet, on a Chromebook. So we, we did uh, purchase and issue workbooks in the four core areas uh, to all of our elementary and middle school students, just as a backstop measure for students who could not access learning online at all. Um, so we, we got the Chromebook situated and we'll have that better situated in the fall. Now internet is really the next, uh, you know, we, we almost refer to it and think of it as, as uh, in the age of a pandemic, having internet, it, it almost becomes a human rights issue. That, uh, you know, if it was a family without water or, or access to, to electricity, we get, the community gets very concerned. Um, we know that some students just really did not have uh, any access at all to, a, to an online learning environment. We're, we're working with uh, several organizations, individuals, and uh, a couple of businesses to work to address that for the fall. Melissa, for, is from a teacher's perspective, uh, what are the challenges for, have been the challenges for some of the remote learning? Um, well, sometimes the technology doesn't work. <laughs> Which, you know, that's just part of it. Um, and just a quick example, so um, my online math program, which for the most part I think is fabulous and it, you know, it's a good interactive where kids can check their answers. If they're unsure, they can walk step by step through, but there's this little pop-up blocker, which if that's turned on, I'll, it's blank for them. Mm. And, you know, trying to walk them through trying to find it sometimes is difficult. And that's, that's a 13-year-old, you know, versus a small child. So. Those little technical glitches, you know, if we can get those um, short up, I think much of our curriculum has an online component now, which is helpful. So at least from K to eight, high school, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. McCann, this may be a little bit different. 
Um, but we have an online component and we've been incorporating that into our classes anyway. So it's fairly seamless for the kids that are used to it. So that was that was good. Um, you know, Google Meets has been has been um, a challenge. Some middle schoolers are not too keen on seeing themselves on camera. So you know, working through that. So I know I allowed them to have their camera off, but I think in the fall that might be something that needs to be required so that we can you know have that interaction. People need that face to face. I need to see what you're doing, you know, and how you're reacting to what we're try to make it a real a real classroom experience per se um, versus I have my screen off so I'm playing Candy Crush while I'm watching your lesson. <laughs> And, and isn't that, you know, but what you're saying, Melissa, too, I think really sort of hits home in the fact that, um, you know, having having Google Meets and, and doing things by by video, um, you know, is is better than not. Correct. Uh, but it's really that social that in, in person socialization or uh, six feet away socialization at this point, even we would take that right. Um, you know, that really, I, I think, is really important, and, and I worry personally as a parent, and I'm sure you uh, both worry about, uh, you know, all of the ch uh, children K through 12, um, you throughout Pittsfield, throughout the Berkshires, throughout the country, and throughout the world, with regard to sort of the challenge of this socialization, and, and really when you boil down to it, um, you know, a, a, a school education is about learning, yes, but it is really about socialization and uh and and that is i think one of the biggest tragedies to this whole thing is the fact that we've gone now for what pretty close almost four months now <laughs> not that i'm counting it's been 100 plus days <laughs> i know that much um and, and so i think that's really some of the big downfalls and um and i think you know going back into you know a fall class situation as well that will be good, but it'll also be at a distance, even though everybody's there. Am I right about the socialization part? Or? The, the, you know, um, uh, uh, go ahead, Missy. I'll jump in after you. <laughs> um, I, I totally agree. Like socialization and, and learning how to, um, you know, just be with other kids and other people and how to interact is one of the biggest things that kids learn from kindergarten all the way through. Um, 12th grade, how to work with other kids, how to collaborate. That's a skill that they need to have going into the workforce, going into college, going into whatever trade. Um, so it's a huge, huge piece. So if we're doing remote learning still in the fall, we need to figure out how to incorporate that into our classrooms and into our lessons. How can we build that social emotional piece and that, um, you know, just being a kid into, into that process? Yeah, we would, you know, uh, I would agree with all of that and say, you know, that there's, there's, the, there's a piece of, of social and emotional teaching and learning. Then there's also just the very, very human piece that as I have observed students over my career, and as I had a, a college senior, a college sophomore, and a high school junior learning from home this spring, um, and they were all as happy about that as their mom and I were. Uh, you know, I, my observation with my, my high school age child that's, that's at, for about the last hour now a senior at Pittsfield High School, um, social, socialization is almost like oxygen and almost like water and almost like food. Um, they're, they're, it is something that's not only nice, but it's something that is completely necessary. And it doesn't need to be structured, it doesn't need to be educational, it's just um, young people being young people. And I, I you know, had a teacher uh, stop by here yesterday, stop by my office, and we were both wearing masks, we were distanced, uh, had a nice chat, and uh, you know, we, were, we were talking about the fact that if, if nothing else comes from this COVID-19, uh, situation. It, it, it has certainly taught us who do education, and we hope that it's taught everybody at home that's a client of, of public schools, that there is no replica for public schools. There's no replica in Pittsfield. There's no replica in America. There's no replica 
in the world. Um, what we do is incredibly important on a hundred different levels. And, um, you know, sometimes thinkers and, and, and sometimes even elected officials from a, from a certain political bent would like to say that, you know, we could do this a lot easier, a lot cheaper, a lot whatever. There's nothing that, that mimics school and there's nothing that's as powerful as school. And, and, and this, if nothing else, serves as a good reminder to all of us of that. Well, that sounds like a wonderful place to end all this on. And I would be remiss in, in not mentioning the fact that today technically is the last day of school in Pittsfield Public Schools. <laughs> what, what a semester it's been. Uh, and I do wanna thank, thank you both, Superintendent Jake McCandless, Melissa Campbell, president of the United Educators of Pittsfield and uh, teacher at Herberg Middle School. Um, it's, been a, it's been a real honor and pleasure to have you both uh, here to, to discuss these two very important issues. Uh, it's not gonna be uh, necessarily an easy summer because uh, obviously you've both got a lot of work to do in terms of preparing and uh, doing everything. So do try to enjoy your summer as, as best you can. Uh, and uh, it's, been a real, it's been a real pleasure and I am so uh, honored to have, have, have you both uh, here. And um, you know, please, uh, I hope if we get a chance again, we'll be able to do this all over again. Well, maybe in a better conversation. How about that? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Uh, lady, folks, uh, again, this is Kevin Moran uh, of the Berkshire Eagle. I want to, uh, again, thank my guests. One of the big, uh, you know, things that's coming up, too, is is Monday, uh, this Monday, June 22nd at 6 p.m., uh, the Berkshire Eagle is having its uh, Berkshire All-Stars Awards show. It is a wonderful video. We can't have the our traditional All-Star Sports Gala in person this year, but we've put together a, a really fantastic video. Uh, it's hosted by Major League Baseball pitching legend, Jim Cott. He's fantastic. Uh, and he takes us through honoring more than 50 high school athletes and their coaches. And this will be Monday night, June 22nd at 6 p.m. right on BerkshireEagle.com. It'll be on Facebook, on our, on our Berkshire Eagle Facebook page as well. And if you don't wanna spend the night on the computer, just go over to your local access television station at six o'clock. PCTV will begin rolling this video at 6 p.m. on Monday night and Really, it's, it's a great time. We are so excited to be able to honor uh, these talented athletes and their coaches. We'll also be revealing uh, who our male and female athletes of the year are and who our teams of the, team of the year is. So with that, I wish you all well. Uh, have a great weekend and thank you so much for watching.